We are live. Okay, welcome everyone to this month's live stream. Um, we have the amazing Dr. Nick Estes with us. Um, for anyone who doesn't know who Nick Estes is, he's an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico. Um, he's a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, and he's a co-founder of the Red Nation, which is um, an organization dedicated to the liberation of native peoples from capitalism and colonialism. Um, he's the uh, the host of the Red Nation podcast, which is a really awesome podcast that everyone should check out. Um, he's also the author of Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline, and The Long History of Indigenous Resistance. So thank you so much, Nick, for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Maxi. Awesome. Okay, I'm really stoked to have this conversation. Um, I was just saying before that I have a number of questions. I always come up with a lot of questions. So um, I'm gonna ask these first and then um, hopefully we'll have time for some questions from the chat at the end. And if anyone has a question related to something that we're talking about, then um, I'll just bring it up at the time. Um, so I thought we could start with US election stuff. Like you almost don't wanna talk about it, but unfortunately the US election takes up the entire world's airwaves for years at a time. Yeah. Um, so I thought we could start talking about that in relation to US empire and then move into decolonization and land back stuff. Um, so the election, Joe Biden, um, I guess I'll preface this by saying that in the run up to the election, I tried not to comment on it too much because I'm from Canada. I'm, you know, I'm not from the US. And so if I was criticizing Biden or something, people would really take that as like, someone who doesn't even live here condemning us to fascism or something like that. So I kind of just sat back and, you know, took in how people were approaching it. And I think a lot of leftists were approaching it like, you know, voting for Biden is strategic. It's somehow, you know, some harm reduction or something like that. Um, but I did see a lot of people vote shaming like BIPOC comrades who for very good reasons did not want to engage or vote in this election. So I guess I'm just wondering um, how you, you know, as an indigenous activist who cares about decolonization, um, how did you approach this election and either engage or disengage? Um, like, what did it mean to you? Yeah, I guess the simple answer to that. Well, first of all, I I, I was going to ask you if you're Canadian. Yeah. You said, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> broadcast <laughs> that giveaway. But, uh, no, I think like the first, like the short answer to that question is, uh, you know, I'm part of a union, uh, the American Federation of Teachers, also United Academics here at UNM, and um, our union does a lot of, you know, voting, like promoting, like you know, um, elections and things like that, and they side with certain candidates. Uh, so I tend to align with my union, um, especially in local elections, because it does affect uh, education. Um, so I would say like my approach to it is more from a like it, like initially from a strategic point of view is from a point of view of organized labor mm -hmm. uh, and then from a point like a larger kind of political context. And I agree with you in the sense that um, there there is this kind of uh, hypersensitivity around uh, the electoral process in the United States, but that's not what democracy is. Mm -hmm. And there's often a confusion of uh, voting or uh, elections with the actual, you know, democratic process. And we actually did an episode on this uh, for the Red Nation podcast um, with uh, the historian Roxanne Dabaratiz, where we talked about this in mm -hmm. the kind of cult-like following around the U.S. Constitution, especially with, as it relates to, um, like, you know, the 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 creation of the federal system and how indigenous peoples fit within that. And, and oftentimes, I think for good, very good reason, we talk about the US Constitution and the electoral process in terms of the black vote, because that's really where, uh, where or how uh, the, the electoral process was actually created, was to actually <laughs> marginalize and create minorities out of uh, black people themselves. Um, and that's when you have people who, you know, like you have the three-fifths compromise, um, you have the creation of the electoral college, which guaranteed uh, kind of like a, a majority of a minority, um, in, in meaning that like the southern states uh, would always have kind of a, a majority voice or an overrepresentation within the kind of political process uh, because they would have an equal amount of senators as well as equal amount of uh, um, or overrepresentation of electoral votes. 
Mm -hmm. so to make a like that's like really kind of getting into the weeds of things but to make a long story short is like we don't live in a democracy we don't directly mm -hmm. elect a president um first and foremost and i think it's okay it's not a radical thing to say because as we can see right now even with the results of the presidential election there's a refusal on part on the part of republicans to actually accept the election results mm -hmm. so they, they, they're cynical about um their own you know quote unquote democratic processes mm -hmm. for indigenous people this raises a, a you know a series of larger questions and this is something that we approached in that podcast and it's something that i think we should be thinking about not just as indigenous people you know we're not just some kind of like special interest that shows up every four years to vote mm -hmm. uh, for this or that candidate um but there is you know we are we represent kind of a political block and there's a reason why yesterday during the maga rallies during the make america great again rallies for trump in dc mm -hmm. you saw a sign that says um that said um uh, what did it say uh first we go after the the blacks and and the indians um and it was like a very explicit you know thing because indigenous people uh, there's an acknowledge there's a there's an acknowledgement that indigenous people not through the electoral process but through the federal system and just by the mere fact we control large amounts of land we have a lot of political power in this country mm -hmm. uh, but we've been effectively made within the electoral process and even within the kind of constitutional process of a minority like an ineffective minority to mm -hmm. the point where you know at least the right wing acknowledges our, our power and our, the, the actual threat we pose to their political project Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you have like liberal CNN saying that, um, you know, we're something else in the category of voters, like literally, quote unquote, something else. What? Oh, you didn't see this? No. Oh, my God. It's like <laughs> for like a hot for like a hot minute. Well, actually, like it, it literally it literally became played out in Indian country uh -huh. uh, like within the matter of an hour because there were so many memes created about it. But there was some wow. CNN you know, pollster who was like, they did some kind of exit poll and they were like, these are the, you know, these are the, the, the categories of people who voted today. There was like whites, Latinos, uh, African-Americans, Asian-Americans. And then the bottom was a small something thing else. that said something else. Oh, God. <laughs> so, so, yeah, there was a lot of joking about it. And I think uh, for yeah. a lot of us on the left, you know, there there is this kind of like you said, there was a lot of shaming amongst indigenous people to get out to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not to minimize the impact that uh, native voters had. And I can talk a little bit about that because I do think that they contributed to flipping states like Arizona. For sure. But there was an emphasis like, you know, coming from uh, people like Deb Holland and others um, that, you know, voting is sacred and that mm -hmm. uh, it's our obligation as native people to vote in this election. And you know that was very much a liberal narrative, but mm -hmm. like the, the liberal mainstream like didn't even recognize this. We did, and somebody was like, "So we did all this voting as sacred stuff, and then we we get categorized." As yeah, <laughs> so I know that's terrible. And you're right. Yeah, I mean the Navajo Nation was pivotal in flipping um, Arizona, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, and I I just saw this on the left, um, like people who are anti-capitalist. Um, yeah, just not really understanding why, you know, some indigenous people might not want to legitimize the US empire through voting, right? And then kind of putting it all on BIPOC people, um, even though, yeah, BIPOC people are the ones who really make or break elections um, for the Democrats anyway, and they did come out for Biden, right? So um, it was just, I don't know, a very strange landscape. <laughs> Right now, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, I would like. I know that people are like, oh, they came out and voted for Biden, um, but yeah. I would make a, a different argument and say, like, I think they they voted against Trump. Trump. Yeah, <laughs> more than anything. That's true. Yeah, but yeah. Um, so yeah, that kind of feeds into my second question um, about you know what does the U.S. empire look like under a Biden versus a Trump, and maybe just high level what does the US empire look like um, between democratic and Republican establishments in general? Um, and what change, uh, or do you think there might be any change um, that will be felt by um, indigenous people or colonized people here and abroad? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I really believe in the argument that the democratic party can be pushed um, to make you know, certain concessions to, to the left 
Um, I would, uh, you know, as somebody who's been an uh, anti-war organizer, you know, for since the, the beginning, you know, since the start of the invasion of Iraq back mm -hmm. in 2003, um, you know, as somebody, I was in high school at that time, and that's really when I began, uh, began to get politicized. Mm -hmm. it had a certain investment within, you know, presidential uh, politics, especially with somebody like, you know, Obama. Uh, I w at the time, I was, I was a little bit like, you know, I was a little bit disenchanted with the D Democratic Party uh, on a whole, but like still nonetheless held out some kind of belief or hope that, you know, Obama ran on closing Guantanamo Bay. And I was like, this is a good mm -hmm. sign because he's going to start dismantling this, you know, security apparatus that was created under uh, the Bush administration and the expansion of the global war on terror. But as we saw through eight years of his presidency, he didn't do anything uh, along those lines, and in fact, in expanded the Bush doctrine to something you know we could call the Obama doctrine. He actually increased drone warfare, something mm -hmm. that his, you know, his um, the his predecessor Trump uh, ended up doing. You know, and so what I see the the current Biden administration um, doing is is actually I don't think they're interested in Trumpism so much. I think right now the political landscape is Trump's Trumpism versus everything else. Yeah, uh, and in fact, he's done this really bizarre marriage of uh, uh, Obama and um, I, it's not so bizarre, but it's a it's a marriage of Obama era like policies or, and uh, administrators and officials with the Bush era, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of the people he brought, you know, the the conserv the never Trumpers that he brought onto his campaign. Mm -hmm. So. I don't, I don't see that as a, as a real alternative. And in fact, I think, you know, whether one believes in these things or not, the, you know, like if, if you're a follower of like the, the democratic socialist wing of, of the, de the democratic party, they were more successful in their election campaigns when they were mm -hmm. candidates who ran on things like defund the police yeah. and Medicare and specifically Medicare for all because mm -hmm. that's an affirmative policy that like, I think everyone can get behind, mm -hmm. but all of the kind of cynic, cynical corporate Democrats, you know, largely like they didn't have that same, that same kind of uh, um, uh, election record. They didn't have that same kind of success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's something, you know, there's something to that. And, and where like indigenous people fall within that line is that, you know, we had a really good conversation with a journalist friend of mine recently um, who covers tribal affairs for the New Republic, uh, Nick Martin, and we talked about how, you know, the, the primary way that indigenous people are racialized in this country is through disappearance uh, mm -hmm. and erasure. Mm -hmm. That's, we are not supposed to be here. You know, I think there was a study that said um, less than 25% of Americans uh, acknowledge that they've re met a real indigenous or had a conversation with a real indigenous person. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're under the terms of constant erasure, that lure of like representational politics, whether it's on, you know, in the Democratic Party or in the Republican Party is very strong because we simply don't have any kind of mechanism within this current system to actually leverage uh, indigenous rights or, you know, indigenous sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, so I would say, you know, you're completely right in terms of Obama and the administration and people kind of forget that Biden was part of that, you know? Um, so uh, yeah, I don't think Biden is particularly good on foreign policy. And then um, I guess, could you speak a bit to um, Biden or Obama's role in like the violence that was enacted um, towards uh, water protectors at Standing Rock? Because yeah, I mean, I think I, I missed, I didn't answer the other part of your question is about like how oh, you know, right. Biden, Biden yeah. would, you know, would be on foreign policy. And I actually don't think he would be, um, I don't, I think it would be a different flavor of what Trump is doing. I would mm -hmm. think it would be a continuation of the Obama era. And, mm -hmm. you know, we saw, we had a, we had a, an actual coup attempt, several coup attempts in Venezuela under Trump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we also had a successful coup attempt or a successful coup in, in Bolivia, but mm -hmm. if we go to the Obama years, you know, you can point to like Honduras uh, mm -hmm. and the, you know, the entering into the, the Syrian civil war and all these other kind of examples mm -hmm. of, you know, it's it was a total interventionist policy on, on, on behalf of the, the Obama administration. Yeah. Um, and I think 
we it, it's a weird moment because you know four years ago um standing rock was popping off because after the elections on november 8th there was this um large disenchantment with um you know across across the left you know in general there's this kind of sense of dread mm -hmm. the kind of waning of the obama administration and the entry into this kind of trump era Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that, like, you know, people like uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez actually announced her successful bid for Congress while she was at Standing Rock. Because oh, wow. like, I mean, she, you know, she saw just, you know, she, she saw a lot of like no alternative. And it was the only like sustained protest movement that mm -hmm. was going on at the time. So I remember uh, like at the, around Thanksgiving or things taking when I showed up uh, the last time, you know, for my last time that I was there. Um, there was just a stream of cars like coming into camp because it was everyone, you know, kind of put a lot of hope in that. Mm -hmm. I would say the impetus for things like the Green New Deal um, came out of that political alternative that was offered at Standing Rock. Mm -hmm. And the failure of the, the Obama administration, I think, is, is very apparent in the sense that Obama never, he only acknowledged it once publicly, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, that this was happening in Standing Rock, and he, you know, he said, "We'll look into it." And at that moment in time, it was like one of uh, one of the largest uh, police mobilizations, right? You mm -hmm. have to remember, this is a rural geography. You there was deployed over ninety different law enforcement jurisdictions, including federal jurisdictions such as Customs and Border Patrol, Homeland Security. Um, uh, I think I don't know if ICE was there, but I know some of their equipment was used. In that, as well as you know, Hennepin County uh, Sheriff's Department, which is you know the the county where George Floyd was actually murdered by police, mm -hmm. uh, and also Mant uh, Montana um, Highway Patrol, who actually later went on to um, go around the country uh, to uh, teach law enforcement jurisdictions how to put down um, rural uprisings, uh, specifically on Indian reservation land. Wow! Um, and you know. Obama never really acknowledged it. I don't know. I'm actually going to I'm going to read his I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing, but I do want to read his new uh, memoir to see oh, like yeah. what because he has to acknowledge it because yeah. David Archambault's sister, the president of or the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe um, was part he was, she, she was an Obama appointee in in his administration and Obama actually visited um the Standing Rock Sioux tribe back in 2014. So wow. there was a direct connection between Standing Rock and the Obama administration. And mm -hmm. you know, so he had to have known, but even in his, even in the, in the, you know, in the, in the years where he reflected back on his administration, he talked about, you know, being politicized by the civil rights movement and seeing the images of, uh, black civil rights, uh, organizers and people part of the black freedom struggle getting, uh, you know, sprayed by fire hoses and attacked by attack dogs, but not mm -hmm. once did he mention the fact that that actually happened under his administration. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm really, I am really curious to see if he'll, like what he'll say about that. Um, I guess one of my worries, I don't know if you share this, is that, um, you know, under Obama, I just, you know, when the Democrats are in power, obviously people think that there's kind of, um, I don't know, that things are better or they're fine. Um, like Biden's running on this quote unquote return to normalcy. Um, and I worry that, uh, you know, under Trump, people who probably wouldn't have cared so much about a coup in Venezuela or <laughs> a coup in Bolivia, I feel we're just really like everything Trump did was bad. So it was a lot easier to get, you know, average libs or whatever to be like, yeah, this is bad. This is regime change. We don't like this. Um, and I guess I worry that, um, and, and yeah, similarly, like under Obama, I feel like um, even though Standing Rock um, and Ferguson, like that happened under Obama, it doesn't really stick to him the same way that it does to Trump. People kind of think like, oh, well, I'm sure he wanted to do something, but he just, his hands were tied or something. Whereas under Trump, it's like, no, it's all Trump's fault. He's horrible. This is a horrible administration. So I guess I worry with Biden that we're heading back into this, you know, phase where people will see things like, oh, the coup in Venezuela, and it'll be more kind of like maturity politics, like, oh, well, you know, of course, we have to do this to help the people or we have to, you know, it, it's, it'll be more respectable. Um, whereas under Trump, you know, it won't be, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. 
Yeah, I think it's important. You know, I, I talk about this in my book, and you know, I've talked about it uh, since the Trump ele election. Um, that oil and gas, domestic oil and gas production in the United States actually increased 88 percent under um, Obama um, because wow. of his, and not necessarily because of his policies. I mean, there was the the fracking revolution um, and the advent of uh, certain kinds of technology that made fracking for a short period of time um profitable now we're seeing that it's not profitable uh and so like biden has hitched his uh his wagon to a dead horse that, that's not a good analogy <laughs> his wagon to a sinking that's a really awful analogy but yeah. <laughs> but um you know the the, the i think one of the the elements that sticks out to me about that time period was uh in a democracy now interview um, Winona LaDuke was like literally walking to the front lines in Standing Rock in 2016. And I don't know if it was Amy Goodman or somebody was like interviewing her as, you know, like as she was like doing her thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, you know, what do you see this as? And, you know, she's like, this is, this is a, this isn't like an escalation of aggression against uh, Venezuela. And they're like, wait, what? Like, how did, like, how's that connection being made? And mm -hmm. what she said is that Venezuela has the largest uh, known oil reserves in the entire world uh, and the development and the exploitation of natural or oil in, in the United States as a domestic kind of uh, economic development program mm -hmm. is directly related to the sanctions campaign that Obama uh, implemented and, and you know he tightened the screws on Venezuela and you can read like the WikiLeaks cables to see like this kind of mm -hmm. you know this kind of escalation and aggression that he he was uh, pushing against um you know chavez and then you know uh, later maduro but it was a way to implement sanctions against venezuela um and to wean the united states off of venezuelan produced oil mm -hmm. um, and so you know obama's obama's energy policy was uh, towards american energy independence right mm -hmm. it, it was like by any means necessary in the sense that it would develop the most exploitative forms of oil and gas develop you know uh, drilling mm -hmm is fracking, uh, while also exploring green technologies. And I think it's fascinating. I'm, I'm interested to, to see, I don't know where Biden actually falls on this. I've looked and looked, and I think there's a reason why we don't know the answer to this, but mm -hmm. um, he's he's come out in opposition to the Keystone XL pipeline, which by the way is really funny because Trudeau, uh, when he met the president-elect uh, Biden, when he had a meeting with him, his mm -hmm. only topic of conversation was try to, to try to get Biden to reverse his decision on canceling the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. Good, but, yes, good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So liberalism. <laughs> liberalism. My, my, you know, what I'm really interested in is like he hasn't he hasn't said anything publicly about the the Code Access pipeline. Mm -hmm. You know, I wonder why that is. I wonder if his energy policy is going to be the same as Obama's in the sense mm -hmm. that Obama, the reason why. He, sh he shut down the Keystone XL pipeline permit is because it crossed the international border and it didn't fall within his um, American energy independence thing because he was interested in developing only the kind of domestic capacity. Whereas Trump is like, he doesn't care where it's coming from. Like his, his he went from energy independence to, you know, en unleashing American energy dominance is, you know, the term that he uses mm -hmm. on the globe. So it'll be interesting to see where, you know, Biden falls, falls you know, falls on this because the the oil going through the Dakota Access Pipeline is primarily fracked, mm -hmm. and he's refused to come out in yeah. opposition to fracking. So who knows? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> I think he's going to definitely have to be pushed really far on that. But yeah, it is kind of the same in Canada that um, you know all these pipelines are kind of. Um, touted under the banner of like, oh, well, we need to develop Canadian oil, which is the dirtiest oil. Actually, the tar sands um, is even worse than fracking. Um, but yeah, so we need to just run roughshod over indigenous rights in order to have quote unquote energy independence. But there's no, we're not even really developing um, green energy. So well, the um, argument that Trudeau makes is he's like, we have to develop the dirty stuff to get the clean stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah, liberalism. Um, 
So uh, I wanted to move to the Supreme Court. So um, Abby Martin from the Empire Files made a video about why we should abolish the Supreme Court because it's undemocratic and um, kind of all the rest. But she was focusing on uh, Roe v. Wade and the fact that the Supreme Court can overturn the election results. Um, but I wanted to hear your take on that. Um, I know that you've talked about the Marshall decision and how really devastating that's been for um, you know upholding the treaties. Um, but, you know, and then there are some good cases like the um, the Oklahoma decision where um, a large part of Oklahoma was actually Muscogee Creek Reservation, but that didn't actually give the land back. Um, it was just about criminal investigation. So, yeah, thoughts on the Supreme Court? Yeah, the Supreme Court is a really undemocratic institution. And I agree with Abby Martin, it should be abolished. <laughs> um, I think for indigenous people, I think it was under John Marshall, the Supreme Court justice, who actually expanded the powers of the Supreme Court to 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 have the kind of to wield the kind of influence it does today, um, beyond its original constitutional mandate, because it kind of existed in this. You know, I'm not like trying to uphold the Constitution as like the model, you know, document, but he took lots of liberties with the Supreme Court and the expansion and in the interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, and that's the kind of effect that we're dealing with today. And there's, you know, it's it's no accident that he was the one who decided these three monumental uh, in, uh, court decisions that still affect uh, indigenous people, known as, you know, the, the the Marshall Trilogy, like categorically defining not only the Cherokee Nation as a domestic dependent nation, but all potential or all future indigenous people who would enter into relation with the U.S. Um, and sort of pulling them into that kind of like domestication process with the courts. Mm -hmm. And it really, you know, there's there's debates about it um, within indigenous communities about the best process uh, and the best approach to the Supreme Court. But, you know, the truth of the matter is you get somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who may be good on some issues, um, but historically her record has been really bad on indigenous issues uh, and actually upholding the racist legal doctrines um, that uh, you know, John Marshall upheld, and the the uh, McGirt decision. Actually, I don't. I wouldn't categorize it as a good decision so mm -hmm. much as like they were just upholding the law that they wrote and right. like asking like mediocre white guys to be like, "Don't be racist and don't be a dick," and like, like you shouldn't get a cookie for that, <laughs> you know. And so like Gorsuch was this conservative Supreme Court judge. Mm -hmm. and he wrote like a favor. He wrote like it's actually a pretty eloquent decision. I mean, it, it's you know he's like on the other side of the trail of tears. Uh, trail of tears was a promise. It's like wow, it's you know he's very poetic in his writing. But um, I think at the end of the day, it's like if Oklahoma had been following the law the entire time uh, with these treaties, which are federal law and they're not state law, then mm -hmm. we would be in this predicament in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fascinating to me that the the kind of liberal left judicial process has ceded that ground to uh, interpretation of the textualists you know the, mm -hmm. the scalia school of you know of supreme court justices yeah um, and i don't know i think the only remedy to that particular situation like with with a short-term remedy is to create um some there has to be some kind of act of congress that moves those decisions out of this judicial body and into a different kind of you know uh, a new era of indian affairs because right now we're indian affairs they say we're in the era of self-determination where we get to decide but it's really the era of self or it's the era of consultation where they mm -hmm. just consult us um, as they take our lands and as they make decisions about what what they want to do with those lands mm -hmm. uh, so we are not even living uh in, you know some people call it moving into the era of consent um, and I would say it needs to be something a little bit more robust than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, it's it's fairly similar in Canada, but like the consultation process being really terrible. Um, and um, in Canada, the Supreme Court has very often actually upheld Indigenous rights and title, but then it doesn't actually translate into action on the ground. And I think there's a similar thing where the treaties are with the Crown um, and the federal government, but then the provinces just issue tenures and just disrespect treaty rights. Um, 
But it sounds like in the States, actually, you know, like with that Marshall decision and, and the rest, it it sounds like actually they're trying, they're watering down, like in Canada, they've already, they definitely don't like respect the treaties at all. Um, but I think there is kind of this growing um, movement um, to make people really respect and uphold them. Um, and that has so much power because obviously Indigenous nations can like out of everyone, they can really question the authority of the settler state itself. Um, and then, you know, of like the capitalist projects and whatnot. But yeah, it sounds like um, they're really trying to, I guess, take the teeth out of the political power that you would otherwise have, um, particularly under like under up and stuff. But I doubt that the U.S. is a signatory to that. <laughs> yeah, they are, but it's they like, are? There's, uh, actually Obama, like he was the one who signed, but it was like, emphasizing the non-binding element of, uh, of trip, to say like we're not bound to uphold right. everything so right yeah um okay so i do want to move on to decolonization and land back but people are saying that there's like horrible people in the chat i do have mods so mods can you kick these people out if they're horrid um yeah, thank you. Or maybe I'll just add more mods. But yeah, let me know. <laughs> oh, Catherine, you're a mod. Definitely kick anyone out who's being horrible. Apparently there's like Nazi people in the chat. So get those people out. Um, okay. <laughs> so moving on to um, like decolonization and the land back movement. So on the ground, like in Toronto, the work that's happening on the ground, um, I feel like the majority of radical movements are led by Indigenous and BIPOC comrades and there isn't a lot of debate, like everyone's really on board with land back and decolonization and things like that. Um, but when with the work I do online, I find it actually really, really difficult to talk to um, other settler leftists about decolonization or land back and things like that. People are, I guess, frightened of it. They don't know what it is or they're, they just get really upset by it. Um, and there's kind of this general discourse that we can actually um, decouple or just separate the anti-capitalist struggle from the decolonial one. So I was hoping you could maybe um, speak to that and how these struggles are actually woven together. Yeah, it's it's kind of a yellow, or I don't know what they say, red herring. I was going to say yellow herring. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what a herring is. I think it's a fish. <laughs> it's a fish. <laughs> All these animal metaphors. I think I got nervous because I, I saw you're a vegan and I was like, oh no, I don't want to. No, don't even worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm just really bad at metaphors and I have dead humor. Yes. So, but I think um, the the accusation that gets leveled at indigenous people tends to be like, oh, well, they just want to create an ethno state or, you know, what are you going to do with all the people who live on the land and blah, 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 blah. And those things, those, those uh, accusations assume a lot of stuff, which I think is really like, it says more about um, these kind of like repressed fears than it does about like anything indigenous people represent. <laughs> or yeah. like the land back or decolonization represents. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I would say is that we already live in an ethno state. Um, like the, yeah. read the Declaration of Independence and the original constitution as, as it was written in 1887, read the Federalist Papers. It was, it was very much intended to always be an ethno state. And that's why we're in the predicament that we are. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, there isn't, you know, there, like they didn't just hate indigenous people because like they hated our culture or spirituality or whatever. They hated us for two primary reasons. One, we were a top land that they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, and two, uh, we actually represented an alternative political order to these settler states. Mm -hmm. um, for the first point, the first point, you know, is important because there's this idea in, in going back to these federal case laws uh, and uh, federal law in general as it relates to indigenous people there's a recursive uh, element and this is kind of like a fancy term but basically it assumes that indigenous people were owners of the land uh, mm -hmm. for it to be taken and transferred into the possession of others when in fact uh, land tenure as we know it today is something that um, is primarily I mean it's not only uh, about European kind of like nation states um, but the the land tenure system that we have inherited or that has been forced upon us in this land um, does derive from, you know, a European like tradition of conquest. Mm -hmm. um, but also this idea of ownership is based on exclusion uh, and the right to alienate uh, to alienate that that land. 
we've only been granted one of those rights. We've never been granted the right to exclude anybody under under the law. We've only been granted the right to sell our land or to alienate it to the settler state. So that really debunks this idea that we were owners and that somehow we're going to like go out and like do what do to white people what their ancestors did to us or whatever. That's mm -hmm. that also is a kind of recursive or a, a repressive idea of like this idea of white genocide or the rich mm -hmm. placement like mm -hmm. as if like you know native people you know it, but it, it's, an, it's an implicit acknowledgement that genocide happened right and yeah. that that these property regimes actually uphold the genocidal orders so that actually works in our mm -hmm. favor to say like yeah you, well you're admitting that genocide took place or is taking place mm -hmm. and that your property system is based on it so yeah. we got that one down yeah the one, <laughs> the one is um this idea of uh, political governance and i think um one of my uh, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Emily Riddle, she's a grad student. Um, she's a, a, Mé a Métis grad student from up north. She, she talked about how within the kind of pantheon of indigenous nations that occupy or that live on the prairies or live with that particular land, a uh, uh, landscape that I'm a part of, that it was their negotiated existence with each other that made them sovereign. It mm -hmm. wasn't an exclusive an exclusion right and that sovereignty mm -hmm. accounted for people who you know who were considered like new arrivals or sometimes even settlers themselves mm -hmm. but it was like we have to you know like that diversity is our strength it's not a weakness as it is you know, that plurality i would say that plurality plurality of, of ways of life was a strength for them not mm -hmm. a weakness as it's kind of portrayed within um within this current system and you can look to examples like there's real examples of this like bolivia has a plurinational model model uh constitution that acknowledges the 32 different uh, indigenous peoples that live there and you know makes space and, and and you know it's not like a perfect system because it's you know you have to negotiate those kind of differences uh, but nonetheless there are things out there that show that these things are, are possible and that you can you can create a system of governance that accounts for this diversity versus trying to, you know, I would say that the settler model is the one that, you know, it seeks to replace, it just seeks mm -hmm. to destroy to replace specifically. Mm -hmm. And decolonization, if it's going to happen, um, isn't just about decolonizing your English department or whatever that means, yeah. <laughs> or like hiring a couple of native people um, or getting a couple of native people into Congress, called mm -hmm. decolonization does mean land back. Mm -hmm. um, and it also means that it also understands that decolonization isn't an indigenous problem, it's everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. That includes non indigenous people. Settler colonialism is primarily about the dispossession of indigenous people for land, but it's not only about indigenous people, right? And so um, that's something that I always encourage people to think about, especially uh, what, uh, people who have been indoctrinated and who have internalized like white supremacist ideology that mm -hmm. itself is a structure. It's not just some kind of individually held belief because mm -hmm. the first goal of that, that ideology is to um, make white people behave a certain way and also to make other people behave a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's incumbent upon them to, to, um, to join us in that particular struggle. And one last example is the state I'm from, South Dakota, has i think the highest rates of death uh almost i think in the uh, some of the highest rates of death in the world i don't know where it stands like um uh, uh like uh like the actual numbers like percentage wise but the COVID deaths mm -hmm. have been so out of control uh and it's so fascinating to see because the the more the more people who are dying are actually white people older white people mm -hmm. and so white supremacy actually kills white people too you know yeah. the idea that you're somehow immune to COVID-19 if you don't believe in it. Um, yep. It's actually killing white people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that was really, really well said. Um, and yeah, just in general, like colonialism, colonialism and capitalism has, have always been so completely interlinked, right? Like colonialism um, fed, you know, the, the beginning of capitalism, um, same with slavery, slavery and everything. Um, and then it continues to do so, like neocolonialism and imperialism obviously feeds this capitalist beast. So I just feel like, I don't know, yeah, we can't fight um, colonial capitalism with more colonialism, right? It's just, you can't fight capitalism with more capitalism. Um, 
So um, in your book, Our History is the Future, you also talk about um, indigenous resistance um, as really about kind of a battle between um, two different value systems and really, you know, the the meaning of land itself. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit to um, the importance of this kind of worldview shift um, to create any kind of like sustainable post-capitalist future. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was in this conversation with somebody yesterday where we were talking about oil jobs in New Mexico um, because there's this fear and I think it's, I don't think it's, a, I don't know, I have, I have mixed feelings on it. There's this fear that we can't get widespread support around climate justice policy or any kind of green tra transition or even like any transition towards away from capitalism because these oil workers are going to lose their jobs. Hmm. And, you know, my counter to that would be to say, well, like, you know, it's fascinating, even though indigenous, my, like my reservation, it's a small reservation has been really hard hit by COVID-19. In some ways it's actually been beneficial to us because through the CARES Act, which was not a small amount of money, we were able to employ a hundred people. Mm -hmm. And that employment of a hundred people, giving them jobs to set up health checkpoints and to uh, make sure that people are getting food and have access to um, you know, medications and healthcare has actually created a different sense in our community of, of like service. And uh, you know, you see people who um, you know, aren't, there's a psychological difference that's intangible, right? Mm -hmm. And this was with a small amount of money that we were able to employ just a hundred people, but there's there's a noticeable difference because you know unemployment is is high, right? And so when people are like, oh, we're gonna lose all these oil jobs, it's like, bro, like, mm -hmm. I don't, like our like we've been we've been you know we've uh, we've suffered from un unemployment like forever for like over a century. Like, don't mm -hmm. talk to me about like losing jobs, but also mm -hmm. it suggests that I would say that like creating like what Standing Rock did uh, and what when it talked about the meaning of land, it wasn't just this kind of particular indigenous identity where we just like we just have this like superior local knowledge. I mean, it is superior in some ways, but not like <laughs> not in a chauvinistic way, you know, um, uh, that we had this like superior knowledge of this place and land that just nobody had access to, right? Mm -hmm. The opposite actually happened. They were like, actually, we need people. We need water protectors to come here. Mm -hmm. A water protector isn't, you know, it's based on this kind of indigenous knowledge system of protecting and caretaking the land, but it, like, not every water protector was an indigenous person, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that, like, if we're thinking about uh, the meaning of land and we think of stewardship and caretaking as, as central to not just um, indigenous people's connection to that land and, and the meaning of that land, but actually a livelihood that's attached to a real material kind of basis, like everyone needs cr clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs like healthy land and an environment to live. It's not this exclusive indigenous thing where we're just enjoying like all the pristine environment. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, we actually have a larger like concern about other people. And that goes back to the COVID-19 stuff. The tribes, you know, they weren't just like, oh, we're gonna protect our own. Um, they were like, we're doing this because we want we don't want to spread the virus to to white communities as well. Mm -hmm. Your government isn't taking care of this. Yeah. Right? And so like there's a universal application to this. And so when we talk about the meaning of land and caretaking land, it's not just an indigenous issue. Mm -hmm. but also, you know, there's indigenous people out there who are already doing these green jobs that we're so worried about. Mm -hmm. They're not getting paid for it. And they're not talking about like, oh, we're going to lose our economy. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they're, those jobs that they're doing, defending land and water, mm -hmm. we should think about them as a labor struggle because mm -hmm. we need that. We That's our livelihood as indigenous people. That's our land base. We need that to survive. Mm -hmm. Just as your job is your livelihood, right? And so when we put up a picket line and a blockade, we're asking other workers to stand with us and to join mm -hmm. us on that picket line. And if you don't want to be a scab, right? So don't yeah. be a scab. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, exactly. Um, and I mean, just to the oil, losing oil jobs, I mean, they're going to be lost through mechanization anyway, right? So yeah, we're all going to lose our jobs through like automation. These jobs are already going away. Um, but yeah, I think that's really like apt. And there's obviously so many benefits for settlers. I mean, not that we should um, be in solidarity with land back or decolonization because it would benefit settlers. But, um, you know, obviously, yeah, there is a lot of benefits because, you know, if we actually uphold the treaties, 
then that's just a better environment for all of us to live in, right? And that's just actually, yeah, working towards better relationships between people and the environment and, you know, working to address climate um, change and, and all the rest, right? So um, I think people don't really think about that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask a few questions about kind of this idea of revolution. Um, I, yeah, I spoke to the Indigenous Anarchist Federation about this, about kind of, um, I guess the idea that we could have a settler, oh, <laughs> okay, Nick is, <laughs> Nick dropped off, so let's just uh, wait till he comes back. Um, what's up in the chat? Is, are people doing all right? Have the Nazis left? Okay, Nick is back. <laughs> right. I don't know what happened. Uh, that's okay. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask about this idea of revolution. Um, and um, I guess this kind of, again, speaks to kind of the importance of uh, connecting the decolonial and anti-capitalist struggle, but do you see a, a settler revolution that could like maintain colonial power structures? Um, and how do we avoid something like that? Um. I don't know if it would be a revolution, though. Yeah. <laughs> it, would, it would just be like a state of reaction, which it would already be. A, it would be a counter revolution. I think. Right. Um, Gerald Horn was very. Uh, he's a you know he's a historian who said this. The seventeenth, the the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and the American Revolution was actually a counter revolution. Mm. It looked specifically to um, the fact that you know the British uh, Empire was moving towards abolition, and that the American settlers wanted to maintain the system of you know plantation slavery which is incredibly profitable for them at that time mm -hmm. uh, so they decided to preempt um the the abolition movement and to declare independence to maintain the system of slavery i would add on to that that you know in the eastern kind of like uh hinterlands of or the western hinterlands of the american colonies the indigenous nations were beginning to form larger diplomatic and political structures that were antagonistic to the the American settler project as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was also to preempt the formation of a larger political indigenous political bloc that actually posed like a legitimate challenge to um, the U.S. Empire. But I think or the the burgeoning uh, American Empire. But to your point about um, what you know, like there's this there's this kind of like. I think there's like a like um, there's an oversimplification um, sometimes between settler and indigenous or like a, a settler native binary, because I would say that like that discounts a lot of uh, you know the, the broad experience of you know the kinds of people who were brought to this, these lands often not by choice often through war, uh, enslavement, um, capture, uh, you know fleeing um, economic situations that like that were part of like structural reform programs that the United States helped implement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that indigenous, you know, there's a tendency to say like indigenous, you know, like there's this program for indigenous struggle and we all have to adhere to it. Um, but I would say that there, that like looking at the history of indigenous movements and internationalism, in fact, it's, it's quite, you know, the opposite that they were these like very broad and robust visions that looked to other parts of the world. Um, mm -hmm. It's important to remember that the, the most advanced climate justice policy and movements that we have today, the rights of nature movement actually came from the global south, right? Mm -hmm. The food sovereignty movement, it wasn't a bunch of nonprofits, uh, you know, in the global north, like coming up with this, it was, it was mainly peasant and indigenous communities in the global south who were talking about, we're the producers of this, mm -hmm. we should have to, you know, we should have the say of how this food is used and um, to prevent its, you know, exploitation um, and so I think there's a tendency within the first world, uh, it's a lot of emphasis on like what our domestic, you know, policy and how if we work all these things out, then it's just going to be beneficial to everyone else without really realizing that the United States isn't only a stain on this land, but it's also a stain on the planet mm -hmm. and that it's our obligation to not only listen to um, what other people in the global South have to say, especially in, with the relationships with the United States, but to understand that that also has to structure whatever kind of um, system that we want uh, on this land. And it can't be just um, this kind of exclusive, you know, and this is me kind of pushing the other direction. It can't mm -hmm. just be this kind of exclusive identitarian project because being indigenous doesn't make you an anarchist or a socialist or a leftist or an environmentalist. Like we have to move beyond that because we already have indigenous people in Congress, you know, 
half of whom are Republicans, all mm -hmm. of whom are, you know, pro-war. Like, that's not progress. Like, indigenousness mm -hmm. as an identity is not, um, is not necessarily revolutionary, but indigeneity as a project, as a political project, tends to be. And we see the successes of that, not so much in the U.S. in, in, in creating like a large scale kind of a political um, form of governance that accounts for all the kind of plurality that we have, but definitely, like I said, in like places like Bolivia and, and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere where they're, they're actually practicing socialism. And there is an antagonism and a hostility of the global north even amongst indigenous people towards those movements because they've internalized that imperialist kind of framework of the US that like what we think and do matters to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And in reality, it doesn't, it doesn't really. And we actually, if we are trying to really connect on a universal level, we need to actually listen to like mm -hmm. what, what they've done. And we have a lot to learn from them. For sure. Yeah. Shout out to Bolivia. I think that's probably one of the first times that uh, a, a country has overturned a US backed coup. <laughs> Through elections, so that's yeah, that's amazing. Um, but I guess kind of speaking to that, I was wondering your thoughts on you kind of mentioned um, you know kind of like third worldism kind of uh, uh, ideas. Um, uh, Jay Sakai wrote about how um, in the imperial core, the white working class isn't going to be um, really the revolutionary agents because more often than than not, they're invested in the settler state um, or um, like, as you said, just kind of a lot of people do internalize, even even people who like think of themselves as, as leftists kind of do internalize this kind of imperialist mindset. Um, just wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't, um, I have I have lots of thoughts on that. I would also <laughs> say that like, um, you know, you can't conflate, again, you can't just conflate an identity with a class position. And yeah. I think it's important to understand that even within indigenous communities, there's class hierarchy, right? And I think race is, you know, oftentimes an expression of class because class is fundamentally about power, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say that there is a structural, a larger structural kind of like settler, um, kind of uh, political, like I wouldn't, it, there is an identitarian element to it, but I think on a legal and political structure, it's kind of like embedded itself. Um, to a point where it's seen as the only alternative to things, where it's like we just have to go through these normative political process processes to achieve what we want, um, and we see how that ha there's certain dividends, right, that are paid out to certain, uh, you know, like the, the so-called white working class. Um, but like I don't, I'm not on the, I'm not on the kind of the, the bandwagon to say that the, the like working class is solely white. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of white people in the working class. But also, they're not the working class at the same mm -hmm. time. They're not the, like, you know, the italics working class and that we actually, um, to have a real program of struggle in this country, it's not something that just has to be, like, palatable to, like, you know, uh, white fears or whatever, but mm -hmm. it has to actually engage that that certain contradiction that there are, um, you know, there are people who, you know, who don't necessarily, who don't, they think they benefit from the project, but they don't. And I, I recommend mm -hmm. everyone to read uh, Du Bois' uh, Great Reconstruction or the Black Reconstruction because mm -hmm. it's that book that taught me that you know there he he uses you know I think people have called it the wages of whiteness. He calls it the psychological wage of whiteness. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that whiteness like flattens out class identity and that you know the the clerk at Walmart has the same kind of political interests as Donald Trump. And we know. Yeah how like how big of a fallacy that is right um but at the same time when people say like when they when they when they place an overemphasis on whiteness in yeah. the attempts to decenter it they're actually centering it again mm. um, and so like i'm I always cautioning people against that it's like right we have to address it you know white white supremacy is a real thing that needs to be addressed but it doesn't help if you're always constantly centering whiteness as itself as the problem, right? right. So there's a big difference between whiteness and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And it does inform a class structure in this country. And it does have real material, you know, things. And there's some people who want to who want to um, remove, you know, the, the, the class of uh, the relations of power from white supremacy itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's like racial capitalism as, it, as um, a lot of, uh, you know, people in the black radical tradition have, have you know, eloquently stated 
that you can't separate the two because they're, they're, the class structure is fundamentally about an expression of, of race, right? Because race mm -hmm. is fundamentally about power. Mm -hmm. um, so, I was, you know, there, I have a lot uh, to say about that, but it's, <laughs> it, 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 it bothers me because I, you see yeah. it coming from both sides. You see like the anti-wokeness where it's yeah. like, oh, well, you know, this is why the Democrats, the corporate Democrats, you know, are so cynical is they just think that they can, you know, handpick you know, the, the a representational class of uh, uh, political elites from each of these uh, oppressed groups and mm -hmm. then, you know, call it gravy. Yeah. And, and then the other side of it is saying like, um, you know, well, like all white people, you know, have inherent racism or whatever it is, you know. And um, I would say that like, like if your lived experience, like, you know, if you grew up like in a place that I grew up, like white supremacy, that might actually seem like, yeah, a lot of white people are racist and they harbor these views and like mm -hmm. they probably have private conversations that we don't know about. I don't know. And, you know, like, so there is, I would say that there's a truth to that, but at the same time, like that's a, that's a very cynical way of going about things. And I, I guess like my, you know, as, as somebody who's a socialist and believes in like a universal humanity mm -hmm. I think that we are be, we can move beyond that, but it's going to, it's only going to happen through struggle. It's not going to just be like, right. I'm not going to just like lecture at white people about how racist they are. It's like they they know <laughs> how racist they are, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think that was really beautifully said. Yeah, thank you for that. Um so yeah, there's a few minutes left. Um I do have more questions. I don't I haven't really been seeing many questions from the chat. So if anyone has any questions, um say them now. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to ask my own questions. <laughs> um, so I guess I just wanted to talk a bit more about like this idea of land back. Um, I was listening to a podcast called Give the Land Back question mark from mm -hmm. Flash Forward. Um, and they had indigenous scholars talking about how there's actually all of this federal land in the US, like I think upwards of 30% of the land might be like federally owned land that they could be giving back to the tribes right now. Um, not even not even touching the areas that are highly populated or settled or whatever, um, including the Black Hills. Um, and so I think that's something that people don't really think about. Like they hear land back and then they hear like, oh, well, am I gonna be deported? Or like, I didn't take the land or, you know what I mean? <laughs> like um, things like that. But I, I don't think people maybe realize that there's actually so much that can be done right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's, that, that's something that's been proposed um, like in the 80s, like there was the Bradley Bill um, that that basketball player, I think he was from New Jersey, he became a senator, I think, I can't remember the exact, but he, he proposed giving uh, or returning um, federal land in the Black Hills back to the Lakota people. Um, it, it didn't, it didn't uh, materialize to anything for a, var a variety of reasons, but then next came to like, there was this idea of like the Buffalo Commons that, you know, you, you could take large swaths of the Great Plains and turn it, you know, return the federal land back to tribes for management and, and all those kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, that was like under Reagan, so it didn't really play out well. Um, but, you know, the, the, the question of like, I think it is like a viable alternative because a lot of times indigenous people are, you know, are already entering into these kind of, engagements with like the national uh, park service national forest service for co-management mm -hmm. um and you know like that's good i guess um i don't you know i think a lot of people would find that really um you know uh, like amenable even like uh, white folks as well but the the like the problem with that is that it doesn't address again it doesn't address the class issue um yeah like public lands were 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 created as like a to benefit a quote unquote like public, which we know as like a white settler public, mm -hmm. but also, you know, private land ownership in this country is really fascinating. If you look at the largest landowners, uh, most of them are white men. Most of them are like white billionaires. Like Ted Turner owns 200,000 acres of my treaty territory. Mm. One of the largest landowners in the entire world, right? So land is, is about class power in this country. Right. And if we're not talking, if we're not addressing that, like mm -hmm. the fact that one individual can own more land than entire nations of people, right? You have, again, like the average like non-native person who's just like living in a city who's a renter, you're not an owner. Like you don't, you have nothing in common with with Ted Turner. You have right. everything to gain by his expropriation. Exactly. <laughs> like, like so. It, it, yeah. I, I think the land back conversation needs to move um, towards looking at the the private. 
the privatization of land and the accumulation yeah. and hoarding of land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is unfortunate because for a lot of different nations, unfortunately, like a common way that they can get their land back is if they raise lots of money and buy it back or they get, um, you know, NGOs or whatever to donate money and then buy land back and then kind of hold mm -hmm. it in trust or whatever, um, which again, like as you were talking about before, that's goes along with kind of the colonial capitalist vision of private property and land um, and not kind of a, a great um, alternative. Um, okay, there's one question here. Uh, in the case of the Mapuche here in Chile and Argentina and Rapa Nui, how to reconcile the different views of autonomy and independence amongst groups? I'm not sure if you can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, this is something, you know, it's, there's, again, this isn't like a one size all fits or one one size fits all uh, approach to everything. Like mm -hmm. with the Mapuche, it's like, there's a strong kind of, uh, I would say like anarchist, a tendency among a lot of um, the Mapuche uh, resistors because the, the, the Chilean state and the Argentinian state like literally bisect their territory, mm -hmm. right? So it's actually the problem of, of those states that interfere with the self-determination and autonomy of the Mapuche people. Mm -hmm. But it's up, it should be the priority of how, that, how that's decided should be up to them, right? Because yeah. they're the ones who are taking care of the, that land and the confrontations that they're having in Chile and Argentina are not necessarily, I mean, they are with the state. There is like, there is a lot of state violence, um, but it's at the, at the, um, in defense of these logging corporations, these lumber, you know, these lumber operations, these mining operations and these large, you know, uh, altiplanos, these large plantations um, that are antagonistic to indigenous rights, because again, it, it gets down to the class element. It's like, Mm -hmm. the the security forces and the police in both of these states are uh, meant to uphold a certain form of class rule, right? Mm -hmm. And the Mapuche people are at the bottom of that. But I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, that's there's, there's a lot to get into those kinds of politics, but it, at the end of the day, it's up to them to decide what, you know, they need to be granted or given the space to develop what autonomy means to them and self-define what that kind of governance structure is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's um, a few other questions. Yeah, that was addressed earlier. Um, someone asked, uh, what do you think of Russell Means and his approach to supporting Indian sovereignty? I don't know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. I mean, <laughs> I, I talked quite extensively about it on um, a Red Left uh, podcast episode. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say there's two versions, or there's two like phases of Russell Means. There was one that was very much aligned with the politics of the American Indian movement mm -hmm. um, and the internationalism that it espoused, thinking about uh, indigenous nations as like uh, akin to third world decolonization projects. And his views changed on that over time and he didn't hold those. He became a libertarian later on in his life. Mm -hmm. um, so which one? I guess yeah. the first one you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I'm conscious of your time. Um, I think we can end it there. Um, but thank you so much. Oh wait, there's another one. <laughs> do Do you have to go right now? No, I don't know. I can take. I'll I'll take two more questions. Okay. All right. So this one, I'll put it up on screen. Um, what do you disagree with as far as Jay Sakai? Sakai wrote settlers in response to the mistreatment of his black comrades within the black liberation struggle. I don't know if I have like a fully formed like disagreement with Sakai. I think um, you should read his book in conversation with uh, um, Mike Davis's um, what was it? Something of the American dream, prisoners of the American dream. Mm -hmm. um, I think they talk about the same elements of the same thing from different angles, uh, like the failure of an organized labor in the United States to actually create a workers party or left party uh, is Mike Davis's thesis because there's such an investment into the kind of like racial political order uh, of the day. And um, Sakai's argument is, is very similar uh, in that regard. But he takes like or they take a, like a different kind of approach to it, um, and I think I would say that Sakai is a little bit more heavy-handed. Um, but in some ways, it's needed, and and its critique of like this idea that like 
we could all unify around this kind of vision of like a, a universalized like proletarian you know class struggle because you know the 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 class the settler class doesn't see itself as you know the working class or sees itself as a working class that's separate from other elements or other kind of variations of of the working class and i think mm. that is a is an important like uh contribution that he's that they've made to this particular uh art you know this to be particular debate that i'm sympathetic with because they were one of the first people to articulate a settler uh native and colonized kind of uh class-based kind of analysis um mm. and oftentimes in mainstream you know political organizing even on the left it gets watered down nobody wants to everyone wants to erase colonialism and the colonial relation as if mm -hmm. you know the indigenous people just don't exist anymore mm -hmm. yeah i feel like yeah nobody really wants to talk about settler as a as a social position you know um and again you said like it's really reductive how people talk about that in general but i just i feel like yeah it's it's um i, I just think that was well said um Okay, uh, how should we view Anna Aquash in the history of indigenous resistance in relation to AIM? Um, I mean, that's a big question, but I'll say that like anime Aquash uh, was, you know, was a Mi'kmaq uh, a revolutionary and she was, you know, she was very fundamental to uh, the growth and the proliferation of AIM uh, especially in like Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and her own community, um, and there's all you know this, this. There's been books, numerous volumes written on um, her murder and and her assassination. You know, um, and I would I would what I would recommend people do and in, in to think about the anime Aquash assassination and those eight members who were convicted of her murder is to read um, this alongside the kind of larger COINTEL pro operation that was meant to discredit, defame, uh, and you know essentially lead to the assassination of indigenous revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. I read a good book called uh, Black Against Empire, where you know it was for the first time actually. You know, I, I read some of the stuff on on um, you know the the police repression of the Black Panther Party, but I think I it was probably the most comprehensive overview of what had happened and like how. Uh, infiltrators, FBI infiltrators, introduced elements of tor torture, snitch jacketing, um, the kind of paranoia around people being infil infiltrators. Um, but that, at the same time, that's kind of the larger structural surveillance and uh, repression of these social movements from the FBI. But on the other hand, like what we do, what we also fail to do is realize like the, hum the human part of it and the fact that like these were people who were coming from the most, you know, oppressed and repressed elements of society trying mm -hmm. to make revolution and trying to make change and they yeah. make mistakes you know and we shouldn't just like um write hagiographies about them but also um we have to understand what the conditions in which they they were operating and why they made those decisions why they made those mistakes why things turned out the way they did right because mm -hmm. um the COINTELPRO operation didn't just disappear overnight mm -hmm. it may have ended but it, it evolved into a larger, a different kind of form of surveillance and repression. And right. it, it teaches us a lesson in this moment in time to take serious um, state repression, um, but also not to repeat the mistakes of past uh, struggles and past mm -hmm. movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we know, we know it's still going on. Yeah. <laughs> we know very much that they're still watching us and probably infiltrating and on all the rest. But yeah, I think that was really well said. Um, so yeah, just thank you so much for coming on. I feel like I could talk to you forever, but um, yeah, I guess we'll end it there. Um, I've linked where people can follow you in the description box, but do you want to just shout out quickly before we go where people can find you in your work? Sure. Um, uh, my major political work, or I guess my major political project is The Red Nation. And you can follow that um, at The Red Nation on Twitter uh, or theRedNation.org uh, online. And we have various uh, Facebook and Instagram accounts for our various chapters throughout um, Turtle Island. Um, and then also the Red Nation podcast. It's on all the major podcasting things. You can find it on Apple iTunes, Spotify, whatever the other ones are, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I guess the best way to support, I would say is to look at our land back campaigns that we're supporting right now. There's the Miluzaham um, camp 
um, that's providing temporary shelter for uh, our relatives, Lakota relatives who are living on the streets in places like Rapid City. Um, there's already been several exposure deaths. Um, there's also the Shinnecock uh, Sovereignty Camp uh, in the Hamptons mm. uh, that's going on right now. Um, you can, uh, that's Warriors of the, Warriors, Warriors of the Sunrise is their Twitter handle uh, as well as their Instagram handle. And so if I don't, you know, if you want to donate to those things, I'd recommend donating to them. They need help. They need amplification. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the work that I would support. Awesome. Yeah, I'll link that below as well. Um, so great. Just thank you. And thank you, everyone. And have a good night.